Welcome to the Hard Questions, Real Answers podcast. I'm your host, Pastor Nat, and today we're going to talk about some real sensitive subjects. Those topics are anxiety and depression. What do you do if you suffer from anxiety? How should Christians respond to these mental illnesses? Can you just pray it away? What are some practical steps to overcome these battles? All of this and more with my special guest, Dr. J.P. Moreland. J.P., great to have you with us today. Well, Nat, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. Well, you know, J.P., I've been blessed to learn from you uh, from the classroom to conferences I've attended, and of course, through your books. Now, you've been named one of the top 50 influential living philosophers. I mean, that just says how incredibly intelligent you are, uh, theologically trained and well-published. But in 2019, you published a book that I bet you never thought you would author. And that book is uh, Finding Quiet. Uh, Would you just share with our audience what this book is about and why you wrote it? Well, that's such a good question. Uh, The Hmm. book is about uh, my personal struggles with uh, uh, clinical anxiety and um, what some things that I learned that have relieved me of that. So this is a book about, the, for those who have anxiety and depression, but I'm just going to use anxiety, uh, and how to understand it, uh, and, may, and some new fresh ideas that perhaps they've not heard of before uh, as to how to get rid of it and uh, to, to deal with it. And it was uh, really uh, the result of my own journey. Hmm. Well, and we're going to get into the heart of the book uh, over the next 20 or 25 minutes, uh, but I'm just curious, is this something that you battled your whole life, or was this something that came on later on in life? Well, I was born with a genetic predisposition to anxiety on my mother's side of the family, which I can trace uh, through at least four generations. Uh, Now, that doesn't mean I have had to be an anxious person, but it made it easier for me to be that way. And then I grew up in a family where I learned that the world was not safe and I learned how to worry and be anxious from observing my mother. So all my Mm. life, I had a tendency to be anxious, but it never uh, rendered me dysfunctional. Uh, Mm. I was able to function uh, and I wasn't anxious all the time. But in 2003, uh, as I mentioned in the book, I had something that had never happened to me before. Uh, I had a seven-month nervous breakdown where I had Mm -hmm. almost daily panic attacks. Uh, Mm -hmm. I wanted to die. I was curled up in a fetal position on our living room couch for at least a month. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was afraid Mm -hmm. when the telephone rang. Well, I eventually, through medication and some good Christian therapy, which I believe in both of those, and this book is not a substitute for that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an addition. But then for 10 years, I was okay. And the same thing happened to me again. Interestingly, both of them happened the last day of school after an absolutely stressful school year. Same Mm -hmm. time, both times. But uh, it lasted five months. So what I did... Mm -hmm. Uh, as I've had two episodes of, of serious dysfunctional nervous breakdowns. And I really sense the Lord leading me to take my research skills and to study everything in sight that I could find about mm. this topic and boil down what I learned to a kind of a small set of things I could do. And mm. so I began to practice these things, Nate, and they, they, have, they transformed me. And so I decided that uh, I would share what I learned with the body of Christ because uh, I had proven it in my own life uh, to be so tremendously helpful. Wow. I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Uh, I know when I was in leadership development full-time and working with hospitals, I found out that some of the most prescribed medications were for depression and anxiety. And even when I think about my own family, my grandfather suffered suffered from anxiety and depression. My mother would have a nervous breakdown about 25 years ago. Other family members, even recently that I know, have gone to those places. So this is very common. And it's not just a non-Christian thing. It affects 
everyone. And so that's why I think this is so important for you to be willing to talk about this and to write about it. So let's just get right into your book, Finding Quiet. Uh, in chapter one, you talk about the human person and uh, the holistic approach to these struggles. So what did you discover as you wrote that? Well, I discovered that it is, there's a tendency in the Christian community uh, to reduce us down to our spiritual lives mm. uh, and to find that the solution to anxiety should be scripture and spiritual practices. And mm. I think that that is profoundly unbiblical. Uh, mm. and, and so what I just have studied and learned over the years is that the Bible treats us as holistic beings. Now, what I mean by that is that I, I'm a soul, so there is a psychological and an emotional dimension to me, and a des I have desires and a thought life. Uh, I have uh, a body, so there's a, a, a biological or physical dimension to me, and then my soul mm -hmm. contains a compartment called the spirit uh, that is mm -hmm. within the soul, and there's a distinctively spiritual component. Now, hmm. all of these affect one another. Uh, uh, so if you're having problems in one area, it can cause problems in the other area. So the, so the bottom line takeaway for me was that if I am suffering from depression or anxiety, I'm going to go after this with everything I have. And I'm hmm. going to address the physical, and I do that by, by exercise and making sure I'm getting sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. even if I have to take uh, sleep, sleeping medication, that's better than mm -hmm. not sleeping. Uh, mm -hmm. and through, uh, anti-anxiety, antidepressant medication, uh, subject mm -hmm. to a good doctor. I, I recommend a psychiatrist because they're mm -hmm. specialists in brain chemistry. That's what they do mm -hmm. rather than a GP. Uh, if you, if you can get that. Uh, and there's no embarrassment in this. This is uh, just what mm. I consider to be vitamins for the brain uh, mm. because your brain gets to a point now where you can't produce the kind of chemicals you need uh, right. to, to be buoyed. And uh, you just need to help your brain a little bit. And, mm. and the, the other thing would be spiritual practices and reading, reading the word meditatively and praying in a certain way. And then good therapy and counseling, good sound psychological practices that don't contradict mm. the Bible. So my view is, in mm. summary, that anything is fair game if it seems wise, and it doesn't contradict the Bible. It doesn't have to be in the Bible uh, it, as long as it doesn't violate the Scriptures. And so I take a both-and approach. I'll take secular learning and practices if, I, if they seem wise and helpful and aren't, mm -hmm. aren't uh, anti-biblical. I, I really appreciate what you had to say there, JP, about this being a, a holistic, a holistic approach, a, a holistic philosophy. Because I, I think, unless you've gone through something like this, you you don't understand what it's like. And so I think, from a, a pastoral perspective, or a spiritual perspective. Unfortunately, some of us can think, well, you just got to pray it away and it's going to happen. Um, you know, I remember on my 29th birthday, actually, I was so depressed, I could not get off my couch. I, I mean, and, and my mom, my wife came down, she's like, but, you know, God loves you, I love you, you're a good person. And I'll go, I don't care. It, 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 it don't matter. I'm a loser. I ain't getting off this couch. And so there, there, there was a process, and, and you did have to approach it from a holistic sense, and I love that. And so I, that's why I'm so thankful for you taking the time to write this, because I think a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, have been told, well, you just got to you know, read some verses and pray about it, and it's far more complex than that. So a as you progress through this book, JP, you say that uh, if a person adopts a certain approach to life, one that includes the proper uh, regimen of habit-forming practices, you can defeat anxiety and become much happier. Uh, what do you mean by that? So, such another great question, Nat. Um, the, uh, the the number one takeaway uh, for the for my research is that anxiety and uh, depression are are largely uh, habits that. Hmm. Uh, are ingrained in our nervous system and soul that can be unlearned by practicing hmm. alternative habits. 
And I can give an example of that. But the key idea is that it's, anxiety is not entirely a set of habits because I inherited, <clears throat> through no fault of my own habits, a predisposition towards it. I get that. And some of it is purely bio, biochemical. But mm -hmm. it is largely a set of habits that we have formed that are anxiety triggering. And mm -hmm. uh, what we can do is to replace those with uh, a set of practices that will eventually uh, disengroove the, uh, the bad habits and replace them with a default triggering that brings peace and joy instead of worry and fear and, you know, oh my gosh, what if, and, and, and self-talk hmm. that's negative. So that's hmm. the big idea here. Wow. Well, and I think that's an important thing for people to recognize is when you have a habit, you, you don't simply just get rid of the habit, you replace it with something else. And so that's why it's so important to replace those with things that are positive, that are positive anchors that take you to a place you want to be rather than where you don't want to go. And I think that's such an important thing for people to, to hear. You're listening to the Hard Questions, Real Answers podcast, a Back to the Bible podcast with me, pastor and Bible teacher, Nat Crawford. Joining me today is author and and uh, a distinguished professor of uh, philosophy from Talbot Theology School at Biola University, Dr. J.P. Moreland. And we are talking about his book, Finding Quiet. We're talking about anxiety and depression and looking at it from a holistic approach. And so, J.P., one of the things you talk about in this book, which I absolutely just latched onto because it's something I'm very passionate about, is the connection between what we focus on uh, some people might say what well, we think about and how we feel. So if you would, take a little bit of time and talk about this connection. But also, as a follow-up, uh, how can you change that focus when anxiety and depression set in? Oh, yes. <clears throat> um, uh, let me take your question in reverse order, because I think that Please. will be more helpful. Um, um, think about um, uh, uh, playing the piano. Or, or playing baseball, or uh, your penmanship, whether you're, you know, you're a good writer or, or your writing's kind of sloppy. Now, um, what happens, it, let's just say in baseball, suppose that I am in the habit of swinging the bat in such a way that I swing over it and miss it frequently, or I uh, pull it into the stands and I don't hit it on the field. Now, uh, what I would want to do would be to present my uh, body to a batting instructor as instruments of baseball righteousness and to get rid of baseball flesh. Now, by I mean this seriously, seriously. by baseball flesh, I mean all those habits in my body that are a counterproductive to being flourishing as a baseball hitter. Uh, so uh, now those might reside in my shoulders and wrists. I may perhaps my 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 legs and my feet, and my hips and everything are, are just fine. But what I would want to do is to present certain members of my body, in this case my wrists and shoulders and so on, to a baseball instructor because it's those body members that are filled with fleshiness. And by that, again, and by I mean is bad habits that are making me uh, be a lousy hitter. Now, what would it mean to submit to a baseball instructor? Well, he would look at my swing, and he would give me a way of practicing swinging 100, 200 times a day for three weeks. And he would say, just want you to, this is what I want you to do. I don't care if you hit the ball or miss the ball, do this and do it a hundred times a day, at least for three weeks. Now, you know, as well as I do that in the early stages of doing this new practice, it's not going to help me. I'm going to be worse than I was. I'll be lousy because I, I don't know how to do this new way of doing it. But after a while, it will replace the fleshly bad habits with a whole set of new habits, and I will have been changed. Now, you can't just say to somebody, stop swinging like that. Start swinging this way. Well, now, uh, 
this is exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans 6, because he says to present the different members of your body to God as instruments of not only righteousness, but shalom and well-being and, 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 and flourishing, instead of as instruments of uh, defectiveness and, and denigration and uh, dysfunction. So what, it, what he means by that is exactly this. So what we have to do is learn how to present our brain and our nervous system to God as instruments of peace and joy. Uh, and what we've learned from neuroscience is what we already knew from Romans 6 centuries ago, and that is that the brain it has neuroplasticity. What does that mean? You can retrain and reshape it by changing the way you talk to yourself. So uh, I discovered four batting cage practices, you might say, <laughs> which were four real life practices that I would engage in every day, and, and I'm still doing them every day, uh, which over about two to three months changed the structure of my brain, which triggered fear and worry and negativity. I'm a loser, that kind of thing, uh, to where I, I would uh, habitually feel peace and, and talk, see the world half full without choosing to do so because it was second nature. And uh, so I think one of the first practices I mentioned, and we can go into this later, later or now if you want to, but it it involves exactly what you talked about, and that is the way that we talk to ourselves. So that's the background uh, that I learned about habit formation and how important it is to present our brains and nervous systems, uh, which are members of our body, to God as instruments of well-being by repeating certain practices over and over again under his direction to replace the, the bad anxiety producing triggers with kingdom of God, fruit of the spirit triggers. Very good. Well, and I know we want our, our listeners and those watching today to pick up your books. We don't want to give away the entire package, but why don't you take a few minutes and talk about the rest of those pieces? Because I think people are hanging right now going, okay, this is where I'm at. I need the help. So please keep unpacking. Absolutely. Well, let's let's just take the first practice that, and the book has got so much more in it than just these four practices. So don't I don't want people to think it has to do to do with how to deal with your disappointment with God when he doesn't seem to show up and a whole bunch of other things about medications and so on. But um, uh, the thing that I want uh, to, to focus on right now is called the four step solution. And it is, uh, if I were to recommend any practice, it would be this one. And, the, and the, this is designed to address the problem of our subconscious self-talk. Now, we talk to ourselves all day long, and it's such a habit that we're not even aware of what we're saying to ourselves. But, but because of this, and it's usually almost neg all negative and worry-producing, we end up in the middle of the day anxious, or maybe even when we get up, and fearful and, and depressed, and we don't know why. Uh, but, well, the answer is maybe that I, I'm already talking to myself about what a lousy day this is going to be. Uh, in the presentation I'm going to do at work, I know I'm going to make a fool out of myself, and people don't like me there anyway. I can tell by the way they look at me, uh, and on it goes. I, I'm just a loser. I'm not. I, I, what has my life done anyway? that sort of thing. I'm, I'm way too fat. People look at me and they can't see past my overweight uh, and see me as a person. So I just, I'll never have a social life. Okay. So that, that, that is, that is a habit that is not a good one. That's going to make depression and anxiety do it. The problem is we're not aware we're even doing it. It's such a habit. Uh, Cause you don't choose to do habits. They, they're, they happen on when they're triggered. That's why we call them habits. So uh, how do I get rid of that? Well, you can't say rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Uh, or cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Because those commands won't work 
unless they become a part of a of a uh, discipleship growth strategy where uh, we're doing things to get us to where those verses are are ingrained in our bodies and our lives. That's why we get disappointed in the scriptures because people think, well, you just what you need to do is remember this and apply it, and that'll do it. Well, no, uh, thinking. Thinking about uh, changing the way I swing a baseball bat isn't going to help me one bit. I can read all the books on it and remind myself I'm supposed to do this. I have to do practices to ingrain what I'm learning into my arms and legs. And this is a way to do it. So the first step is called uh, um, relabeling. And what that means is uh, at, at the beginning of the day, I pray Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Search me, O Lord, and know me. Uh, examine me and uh, and see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way of, of shalom. Okay, so I invite the Spirit to help me that day be more attuned to when I'm talking to myself in a negative way. All right, so then... Maybe I'll catch a way that I'm talking to myself negatively. You, you know, you're just, you're a loser. Okay. I, so I stop and I, first of all, relabel that. And I say to myself, wait a minute. This is not, doesn't have any connection to reality. There's no truth to this. What this is, is a bad habit. And I'm just in a bad way of looking at things and thinking about myself and talking to myself. So this doesn't have anything to do with reality. Now, I say that even if I don't believe it, because um, I, I, I want to believe it, and so I have to do things to get me to where I actually do believe it. So say it anyway. And uh, it's not hypocrisy, because you're trying to do things to grow toward that. All right, the second thing you do is what I call reframing it. And in the book, I list 10 different ways that psychologists have identified negative thought patterns. They're called thought distorters. Now, the, the, my favorite one is uh, cat catastrophizing and doing what ifs. I, I, and I lived in the future for years. I'd say, oh, my gosh, what if, what if this happens? What if I, you know, what if I don't do a good job in a lecture? Ugh, people are going to think I'm a fraud. Uh, this is not going to go well. So I spent all my time wrestling with that and trying to convince myself it wasn't true. Well, guess what that did, Matt? That made the grooves that trigger that thought even deeper and harder to get rid of. So what I did is I, I would relabel it. Look, this is just a, a habit. It's got nothing to do with reality. I would reframe it and say, and in fact, I can even I even know what it is. It's a, It's an example of catastrophizing. Now, what, what they've discovered in medicine is that if a patient is able to, get, to simply have a name for what's bothering them, they can stand far more pain without it bothering them than they could if they don't know what this is. So the first two steps give me a little bit of control with the Lord's help by being able to name this truthfully rather than being sucker punched by it. Step three is I refocus. This is crucial. That means that I don't, I don't get down in the mud and battle this and obsess on it and argue against it and try to convince myself it's not true. There is room for that when you're having a thought that it's not a habit and if this is a new thing and you need to kind of think about. It, that's fair game. I'm talking about those that you kind of are constant messages. What you need to do in step three is refocus. Now, that means get into something <clears throat> that gets you into what's called flow. Flow is when you're so caught up into something, you lose track of time, uh, you just love it. And it could be, uh, ch ch I check the Chiefs' websites because uh, that just gets me into it. I love those guys. I might play solitaire. Uh, I might check my email. I might read a novel or watch a TV show or pray or or go for a walk, or listen to Christian music. It doesn't matter what it is, uh, as long as it hooks you. And then you stay there until you're calm. And that could take, in the early stages, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Now it takes me, you know, six, 30 to 60 seconds. 
But what it does is it gets my mind off of it. And then step four, after I feel settled, I can actually go back to that self-talk. Man, you're going you're gonna to make a fool out of yourself. And it doesn't bother me at that moment. It, 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 so I reevaluate then how I did. Now, you have to do that several times a day when you catch these. And if you do that for two to three months, you will begin to cast your anxiety on the Lord because the, this won't enslave you so you can't act any other way. And that, that's a practice that, that helped me. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's one of those verses that a lot of people love to claim, but they, but the, the number one question then is, well, how? <laughs> Like I get it, I get it. Jesus cares, and, and I and like I've used the illustration of of fishing because we're you know we do a lot of fishing here, and you know you cast it, you throw it on him, but but the question is how? How do you do it? I mean, I can throw it, I can throw a hook, but I don't know how to throw this anxiety, this concern, this fear, whatever it is. So those four steps that you lay out in the book and you just talked about are are a great practical example that people can do today. And that's where a lot of people are at. They're like, look, I can't even think about five minutes from now. I need right now today, what can I do? So that's really good. Um, We're running out of time, but there's two final things I want to talk about. The first one is this. You know, we hear it back to the Bible, as are you. You're, you're committed to seeing people transformed uh, into the image of Christ by renewing their mind through God's Word. And, and you talked about this. It's not just one thing. It's not just another. It's a holistic approach. But clearly, the, the God has communicated us through His Word. So I'm curious, based on what you've studied and what you've seen, how does Scripture relate to this working through of mental illness, of depression, of anxiety? Well, it, ha- it plays a huge role. Um, uh, first of all, it is important, if you can, to, to on a weekly basis sit under good teaching from the scriptures. Uh, and that, that's just important. And to, to make available to yourself online, or if we can go when we go back to church, and, and, and sit under that teaching. And uh, that is extremely important. Secondly, um, I, I find ways to read the word according to your own patterns. Like I don't read the word daily, but I might uh once a week take an extended time and read uh and that is does more for me but the third thing uh that i would add to that gets me in the word every day and it's this um dallas willard my mentor told me that um rather than continuing to memorize a whole lot of verses uh it it can be more fruitful to take four or five that really speak to you, that you just, man, you love those babies. They're just, they jump off the page at you. Commit those to memory and let those be the rails on which you run your life from here on in. Now, that doesn't mean you don't keep memorizing if you have a heart for that. But so what I do is when I, when I, before I go to bed and when I get up or different times during the day, I will pray through some of those verses, like, you know, don't be anxious for tomorrow. Uh, Tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Uh, And I will tell, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Anyway, so what I'll do is I will pray those and uh, just sit quietly with them and go through them. And I'll tell you, Nat, I, I have found that that way of praying uh, ha, uh, gets me in the Word every day, though I'm not opening a Bible. Because, you know, the vast majority of church history, people did not have printed Bibles. But to get in the Word, it was through memorization. And um, I'm not suggesting that you, you know, follow the Navigator's uh, mem- memory thing, which is good. That may be good, but you, but you don't have to do that. Get a couple, and in, the, in an appendix in the book, I list about 15 possibilities for people that I think are real winners, man. I, you know, and find your own or pick some of those. And that is healing. It's healing. It reorients yourself to, to what is real and true. And pretty soon it becomes a habit. If you, if you go to those every day, they sort of start restructuring 
uh, what's going on inside of you. Fantastic. Very practical and, uh, and biblical. Um, one final question before, just a word of encouragement for our listeners. I, I've seen family members, and I've even experienced at times when I'm so overwhelmed by what's going on around me or what's going on inside of me that um, it almost feels like you're abandoned by God. And I think there's a lot of people today, in fact, I've interacted with some online today who said, Nat, my life is just seems like it's falling apart. Where is God? What encouragement would you have to those people who are listening today that they feel like they're alone, that God has abandoned them? Uh, what would you say to them? Well, remember, number one, that the book of Psalms was the hymn book of ancient Israel that was recited and sung when they gathered for worship. 28% of the hymns are complaints against God for, being a, for abandoning them and not showing up. It, and so you're in good company and you're on biblical grounds to complain to God uh, and to fuss at him because he knows it anyway. You're not, you know, it's not right. like if you just hide it, you know, he, you know, he doesn't know about it. So express your complaints. They're called lament psalms. And yes. there we are. I, uh, Jeremiah does it in Lamentations. I mean, we're on, we're in good grounds for right. to cry out and say, well, you know, where are you? It, it looked to me like it would have been in your best interest, Lord, and certainly mine, if you'd have showed up and done something. But, you know, I just don't get it. <clears throat> That's number one. You, it, so, so issue a complaint. And I explained in the last chapter uh, how to do that. Uh, the second thing is to, is to take a step back and to try to remind yourself that, that God always sees a bigger picture and that there, there has got to be some reason why he is permitting. I don't believe most of the time he causes these things. I, he can in some cases, but most of the time he permits it. And so there's got to be, there's got to be a reason for that. It's not like um, th th this is not redeemable. And, and what that means is then that I treasure my memories. This is a third step. The second is to, is to trust that there is a reason but then the third step is the Romans 8 passage that all things work together uh, to, for good. Now, um, sometimes you may say, well, it's hard for me to believe that. And that's where you need to go back in, hind in retrospect and see all the times that you went through something that you wouldn't want to go through it again. But boy, you, wouldn't, you also wouldn't want to trade the fruit that, it was, that came into your life from having worked through that problem. Now, if nobody ever discovered that that happened, there'd be a problem with Romans 8.28. I mean, I, let's be honest about it, but that's not the case. You know as well as I do that the overwhelming majority of believers, if they're honest, can look back over their journey and say, no, you know, I, gotta, I have to say, there have been this, 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 and this times when uh, after I went through the hardship, I saw in retrospect that this yes. actually did work together for good. So why shouldn't I believe that this one right now won't do the same thing? I'm not a fool by believing that. I've got hard evidence from the testimony of my friends and my own life. So those are things that I, I would help. Don't, you're not alone. Uh, in fact, it's biblical for you to express your disappointment with God. Uh, number two, uh, to try to remember that God really does have a have a bigger thing in mind, uh, and that so it's and three um, things do work together for good, and you can know that by your own experience. Wow, I think this is the most practical interview we've ever done on this show. People are just going to walk away with with a lot of gold here um, as we close our time, JP. Just overall, what encouragement can you offer our listeners today who are struggling with mental illness? Yeah, two things. Uh, number one, you're going to get better if you will just take the right steps. Uh, please go see a good Christian counselor. Uh, be, go see a, a, a doctor, a psychiatrist, and just see if medication might work. Don't tell me, well, I tried that. It didn't work for me. That's usually an excuse. 
because mm-hmm. there are others you can try and you haven't tried all of them. And, and these doctors know how to find the one tailored for you. Get some help mm-hmm. for heaven's sakes. You're not a mm-hmm. disembodied soul yet. You have a body and it, it plays a role. And then the third thing is through, through focusing on some of these practices, you can train yourself and you, you will get better. Um, yeah. and so it, it may, and right now it doesn't feel that way. I've been there myself. In fact, I've been at a point where I can't even remember what it felt like to be normal. And so you're mm-hmm. thinking, I don't think I'll ever feel that way again. Well, that's bad self-talk. And when that comes right. up, you got to get rid of that, but mm-hmm. uh, you will get better. And then the second thing is this, this life sucks in so many ways i mean we're in a fallen <laughs> world the world is a it's, you know there's a good to this to it but come on this is not home it really isn't right and the older right. i get the more i realize uh, you know my, my my i belong somewhere else my citizenship mm-hmm. is not here and no. uh so uh this is a short journey in light of what we're going to experience after death it's going to be unbelievably wonderful mm. so keep a big perspective and realize that this is a, a short time comparatively speaking absolutely absolutely great words with jp moreland well if any of our listeners or those watching today want to learn more about you um what you're working on or even pick up a copy of your book or other books where should they go well i think amazon.com has an author's page and uh you can look at the different things uh, on there uh, and get a, get a, get get books for a pretty good price. I do have a website, uh, jpmoreland.com, and uh, but I don't do much on it. Uh, I'm just not a techie guy, but it's got some things on there that people might find interesting. So that would be how. Okay, great. Well, JP, we appreciate your time today, and we hope this was encouraging to you, our listeners. Thank you very much, JP. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Hard Questions, Real Answers podcast. To learn more about our podcast, be sure you check out backtothebible.org. Also, if you enjoy our program, be sure to give us a rating and share us if you like us on your favorite podcasting app. Remember, ask the hard questions and only accept real answers.